Okay, well, welcome everybody to the uh, second day of IWOTA uh, and the, uh, let's call it the morning session for us Americans, uh, or, or I guess uh, Brazilians. And <laughs> uh, The uh, first uh, speaker today is uh, Sonny Ter Horse, who I believe uh, attended BotCam at some point. Am I right about that? Uh, what camp? What was that? Votcam, Virginia Operator Theory. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I was a postdoc at Virginia Tech. That's right. I remember. Uh, I remember you. Uh, More than a decade ago. ago. Yeah, always advertising Votcam. We have many Votcam speakers in the audience here. So, uh, okay. he's giving a talk on equivalence after extension and sure coupling. Fred Home Operators and Beyond. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to give a talk here. Um, so I'll talk about equivalent after extension and sure coupling. And these are relations uh, on Banach space operators. Um, and they have a bit of a background. They, they come from uh, solving integral equations and many other applications uh, like linearization uh, of operator functions and so on. Um, and and they've, they've turned out to be very useful there. So eventually what they did is they made some sort of operator, say general Banach space operator uh, technique out of it. And that while they were trying to do that, they ran into some technical uh, difficulties and that's where we came in. And something we've been working on for about a decade now. Uh, and, and somewhat surprising, uh, we ran into all sorts of Banach space geometry problems. So I should maybe say here that I, I do not really typically work in, in Banach space uh, Banach space operator, so I hope you can uh, forgive me for my ignorance. Um, but I think it's nice that I can give a talk here, and I, I hope I can get some uh, some good feedback from it. So let me um, get started. So we'll start with the first uh, relation that's known as uh, sure coupling, and that starts with a sure coupling. So uh, here's how it works. You have a two by two uh, block uh, operator matrix with uh, Banach space operators as entries. And you assume that one of the diagonal uh, operators, say D in this case is invertible. And then you consider this a perturbation of the, uh, the other matrix A, the other operator. And that's what's known as the sure complement of the uh, two by two block matrix, uh, yeah, operator matrix M with respect to D. And okay, why would you wanna do that? Uh, well, there's uh, Eitken's uh, diagonalization formula, uh, probably at that time only a matrix uh, version, but here's how it comes out. So you can factor your block matrix in this way. And um, so you see D here, and you get the sure complement now on the other uh, block diagonal. And the point now is that the other two matrices on the side are all invertible. Uh, I is just the identity operator, so you have identity operators here. And from that, you can easily see uh, the result. That's why it's called uh, sure complement, because that's how it appeared in his um, uh, 1917 paper. Namely, the determinant of this, okay, and then you go back to matrices, the determinant of this block uh, matrix is equal to the product of the determinants of the two things on the diagonal. So the invertible matrix D and uh, the determinant of the sure complement. And you can derive all sorts of very nice properties from that. Uh, and I hope you, there, there are many other things you can do with it. It's, it's quite important in numerical uh, linear algebra, but I'm not gonna say anything about that because I don't think this is really the audience for that. Um, so then turning to sure coupling, that works in the following way. You have your block matrix M, and now you assume that both of the diagonal blocks, so the A and the D are invertible operators. Uh, that means you can, do, you can do two diagonalizations, yeah, one way and the other way. And, and the, the, the fact that you have this relation between the two sure complements more or less tells you that they have many properties in common. Yeah? So that's where the definition comes from. You say the two Banach space uh, operators U and V are sure coupled if we can find such a uh, two by two block operator matrix with invertible diagonal blocks, uh, such that when you get take the two sure complements, you get the operators U and V. Yeah, that's what it means. And I'll say a little bit more about uh, some of the implications 
of this relation. I just copied uh, the definition down here. So the other relation I mentioned is equivalent after extension, and I'll show you, I'll give you a definition, I'll show you how it's related to sure coupling. So we say that U and V are uh, equivalent after extension. If you, uh, well, you extend the operators U and V with some identity, and then they become equivalent um, in the sense that you can find invertible operators E and F so that we have this relation here. And um, you can quite easily see that if two operators are sure coupled, they're also equivalent after extension so coming back to the, this two-way um, uh, factorization, now all the things uh, which are read here are invertible, and the two remaining things are the sure complement. So you can easily see how you get from these, this identity to a form where you have uh, the, the two sure complements and identities and then some invertible operators. Yeah, so that's one uh, relation between the two. And, and as I mentioned, um, uh, two operators that are sure coupled have many properties in common, and here are a few of them. Um, so let's say they're equivalent after extension or sure coupled. And then the one is invertible if and only if the other one is invertible, but you can push that a little further. So for instance, uh, the one has a complemented kernel if and only if the other one has a complemented kernel. Same with complemented ranges. And, and some other more recent results. For instance, you can approximate one by invertibles if and only if you can uh, approximate the other one by invertible operators. And, and another nice result, I think, is that when U and V are compact operators, then they generate the same operator ideal. So that's what I mean when I say, if you have two operators that have this uh, relation that, that they share many uh, properties. Okay, so, uh, here's the result, but I already gave you some uh, an argument for proof. Um, Barton Tikhonovsky proved that if two operators are sure coupled, they're also equivalent after extension. And the question they pose then, how about the reverse? Uh, if they're equivalent after extension, are they also sure coupled? And I'm, I'm not going to go into any uh, uh, concrete applications, but this uh, this implication is actually important in applications. And if you look at them and if you look at the examples. It turns out that it's always the case. And so the majority feeling was that, that this should probably be true and, and hopefully not so difficult to prove, except that uh, it turned out that that was not really the case. So here are some partially confirmative answers that uh, uh, were obtained. Um, okay, I included the definitions of fret home operators and compact operators, but I uh, assume that everybody here will know that, uh, what that is. So uh, partially based on, on the, the application that they had in mind, the first proofs that they, first results that they had proved that it's true for fret home Hilbert space operators. Um, but when you look at uh, bottom space operators, they could only prove it with the condition that the index must be zero. So that's, uh, these were some of the initial results. Um, and here are a few others. So uh, one which is quite interesting is that it's true if sure coupling turns out to be equivalence relation and, and for equivalent after extension, it's not so difficult to prove that that is the case. And uh, that's more or less where we came in about a decade ago. Uh, we showed as a first result that it's true for operators on several Hilbert spaces. And that was followed up by Dan Timothy one year later who proved that it's also, you can leave out the separability condition and you can actually, he actually came up with a very nice characterization of equivalence X after extension in terms of the spectral resolutions of the absolute values. And uh, that uh, I think already gives an indication of the limitation of the argument there to uh, Hilbert space operators. So beyond vinyl space operators, not so much was known. Okay. Um, in our paper, we also show that it's true for operators in the norm closure of the invertible operators. And a few years later, we had a result that it's true for compact operators, uh, but also for operators on, in some larger operator ideal. Um, so, and, and there are some further results that I don't mention here, but as, as I mentioned, the, the overall majority feeling was that this should be true, uh, but it just turns out to be difficult to prove. Um, until a few years ago, we found a counter example. Um, 
And of course, once you, after a long time, find a counter example, you find out that it's not true, you also find an easy counter, counter example. So here it is. Uh, you take for U and V both forward shift operators, uh, but on different LP spaces. So one on LP, the other on LQ, and they must be different. Um, so they're Predom operators with index zero. And my claim is they are equivalent after extension, but not sure couple. And keep in mind what I mentioned on the previous slide that they, they could prove uh, results for Fretom operator, but in, in the bottom space case, they needed this index zero uh, condition, and that comes out nicely here. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you some arguments. I'm not going to go to the details here, but if you start uh, with sure coupling and you want to show that they're equivalent after extension, that's easy, and you can just concretely construct your operator ski and F and show that they're invertible, computer inverses, and so on. Um, so that's not the interesting direction. Um, now, to see that they are uh, not sure coupled requires a bit of work, uh, or well, at least an insight, you need the uh, pitt rosendahl theorem. So um, for any operator T from LP to LQ with Q less than P, uh, the theorem says that such operators are compact. And now you try to prove equivalence after extension. So, well, let's say they are equivalent after extension. You shift the operator, so you get such a, an operator matrix with A and D invertible. You take two sure complements like this. And um, now the Pitt Rosenthal theorem tells you that uh, either B or C is compact. Yeah. So you get a compact perturbation here from an invertible operator, and that tells you that the index of the shift must be zero, which of course is not true. Okay. So that's a, uh, an argument at the first example to show that it, it cannot happen in general. Um, we can push that a little further. So uh, what we do is we look at essentially uh, incomparable Banach spaces. Um, and, and that works as follows. Uh, so two Banach spaces are well, essentially incomparable. If for all operators T from X to Y and S from Y to X, if you look at identity minus TS, that must be a Fredholm operator. And that also means that the index must be zero. And uh, there's a lot that one can say about this. Uh, it's, it, for instance, also true if this is the case and also identity minus ST is Fredholm. Uh, I don't want to give too much uh, details here. Just a few examples. So the, the pitt rosenthal theorem in a way tells you that uh, LP and LQ are essentially incomparable. And there are many other examples, for instance, LP and C0. Uh, there are certain Laurent sequence spaces, LP, and there are some Mori sequence spaces. You can also show that they are essentially incomparable. And then there's a whole list of results uh, uh, of the type here, so say, when X is reflexive and Y is a dump, dump uh, Pettis property, or X is L affinity, but Y contains no copy of L affinity, and so on and so on. Uh, then you get space which are essentially comparable. And for the people that know a bit about this, uh, uh, so totally incomparable implies essentially incomparable. So there are many such examples, and for instance, LP and LQ um, are of that type. Then we managed to prove the following as a sort of an extension of this example. So let's say um, U and, uh, sorry, X and Y are infinite dimensional and essentially incomparable. Then we can completely characterize sure coupling and equivalent after extension. U and V are sure coupled if and only if U and V are fretal with index zero. And furthermore, the dimension of the kernels must be the same. And U and V are equivalent after extension if and only if they are fretal. Uh, with now the additional condition that the dimension of the kernels and the dimension of the co kernels must be the same. Uh, the latter one, of course, you get because they're fed. The index is it all in, the, in the short coupling case. Um, and, and from that, you can easily see, as we have in the example, that in general, uh, short coupling and equivalence uh, do not coincide. And now you can make many examples, uh, including, say, some um, uh, bio spaces where, for instance, you you only have Fred Holm operators with index zero. Uh, interest. Then there's no difference, of course. But the interesting feature here is that um, 
between such spaces, I mean, there are many other operators than, than Fredholm operators, but they just cannot uh, exist in an equivalent after extension or sure coupling relation. Okay. And, and maybe for people in this audience, this is maybe uh, nice. You can also use this as a characterization of essentially incomparable in the sense that uh, X and Y are essentially incomparable. It's the same as saying that all sure coupled operators are Fred Holm with index zero or saying that all equivalent after extension operator, uh, operators uh, are Fred Holm. So it, it's, it really ties in uh, quite nicely with the notion of essential comparability. Um, and the idea here to get here is that when, when you have two bottom spaces and their bottom space geometry is too different in a way, then things go wrong. And we can we see that also from uh, another result here that we had earlier. Um, if you have two operators that are equivalent after extension and one of them is compact, and okay, you can push that a little bit further to uh, uh, the operator being inessential for those who know what that means. Um, then you can show that there exists a closed subspace of Y of finite co-dimension that's topologically isomorphic to a closed subspace of X. And once you know that, so once you have operators like that, put after extension with one of them being compact, uh, you get into a situation where uh, between the two Banach spaces, there are many properties that carry over from one to the other. So for instance, in this setting, if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, so is Y, and you have similar results for separability, reflexiv reflexivity, the rado nicotine property, hereditary dumpus pedas property. And I think we, we Googled this in, in about an afternoon. So if you uh, spend a bit more time on it, I suppose you could get a lot more uh, properties. But again, the, the idea here is that um, when the spaces that for sort of a sensible way of having equivalent after extension beyond thread home operators, uh, the spaces should not be too uh, different. Um, then, okay, so uh, of course, a, a next uh, question then is um, um, what if the spaces are isomorphic to go to the other extreme? I'll explain you uh, some of the results we have there, but we need some definitions here. Uh, so a, a bottom space operator is called relatively regular, but there are many other names for this, I suppose. If it has a complemented kernel and range, and that means you can decompose as in, in such a form where uh, X2 is the kernel and uh, Y1 is the range with S tilde the vertical operator. Um, and, and special cases then are Fred hole, meaning that the two dimensions Dimension of the kernel and the co-kernel are uh, finite dimensional and Atkinson uh, if the uh, one of the two is finite dimensional. I think some books say also it's also uh, semi fredholm but other books have different definitions. And uh, just to mention here, in other books, they call what uh, I call a relatively regular, it's called generalized invertible, uh, which you can characterize in terms of the existence of an operator T, inverse uh, that satisfies these identities and uh, uh, the connection if, it, if it's the same as relatively regular and if, if your s has the form there and for t you can just get the index of the okay so now going to the case where the two spaces are um, isomorphic then um, the question is uh, under what conditions do we have that equivalent after extension implies sure coupling. Um, and it turns out for Atkinson operators and also for Fredholm operators, this is the case. So uh, if we add the further assumption that U and V are Atkinson, well, we can push a little further when they're relatively irregular, but then we have to assume that the two spaces are primary. So primary meaning that if you have a decomposition of your space like this, then Z must be isomorphic to one of the two uh, parts of the decomposition. If, if um, you are in either one of these two cases, uh, then it turns out that sure coupling and equivalent after extension are the same, and they are also the same as the dimensions, sorry, the, the kernels are isomorphic and the co-kernels are isomorphic. So that's, 
is, is say for the other extreme where the two spaces are isomorphic. But if you want to know a little bit more, uh, I mean, what, what if that's not the case? Uh, what, what if we're sort of in between isomorphic or essentially incomparable? And we can take a little bit uh, closer look at the relatively regular case. So to do that, we need another uh, uh, sort of equivalence or another relation on uh, uh, Banach space operators. And that's what's known as strong equivalent after extension. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll explain it a little bit better later, but it means that you have equivalent after extension where the operators E and F, these were the two invertible operators that you got in this relation. Um, uh, okay, I should explain it, but I'll, sh I'll show it a little further. Uh, they get also a two by two block form because you of the extension of your U and your V. And then the E has the left lower corner invertible and F has a right upper corner invertible. And um, th the reason why this is of interest is that uh, Barton Chikhanovsky showed that sure, uh, strong equivalence after extension is the same as your couple. So that gives you a strategy to prove uh, to get from equivalent after extension to sure coupling, namely we, we want to make it sure, strongly equivalent after extension. And, and here's a first result. Um, you, you can always uh, uh, get your invertible operators when you're equivalent after extension in a special form. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but the relevant things is that in your F, you get an identity and then in your U, E, you get uh, the U operator, and, and here you also get an invertible, and there are some relations between the other entries that are not so important here. The, the important feature of, of uh, getting it in a special form is when you want to get to strong equivalent after extension, you already get an identity here. So one of the invertible operators comes for free, and the other one that you must get is this E to one. So then the whole point is getting some sort of construction to make this thing invertible. Um, and okay, then it, it, it gets a bit technical. Um, so now we assume that our operators U and V are relatively regular. So they have such a decomposition with U prime and V prime invertible. Um, and we note that then for relative, uh, when we have operators of this form, they are equivalent after extension if and only, ha if, and only if, uh, uh, X2 and Y2, these are the two kernels, they must be isomorphic and X prime, X2 prime and X2, uh, Y2 prime are also isomorphic. That tells you that the co-kernels must be isomorphic. So we have invertible operators E prime and F prime in this form. And then you go to pages of computations and you can completely characterize the uh, operators E and F in, um, uh, uh, the equivalent after extension relation in a special form as what we had on the previous slide. Okay, it looks pretty horrible, uh, but the point here is that there's a lot of freedom in there. So all these operators that you see at the bottom here, you can choose them completely arbitrary. And the only other thing are the, well, identities in some places and the operators E prime and F prime. And uh, let's not go through it. too much detail, but the point here is that if you look at this block here, that's the thing that you must get invertible. Yeah, and you see, you can choose the X3, uh, X4, X6, completely arbitrary, Y1 uh, and Y2 are all arbitrary. So th the question I always is with all this freedom, can you make this thing invertible? And that brings us to, well, we can reformulate this then. So it's another Banach space operator problem. In the following sense, we have Banach spaces, uh, V, W, G1, G2, such that if you extend V with one of the two spaces, uh, these things become isomorphic and the same with uh, W. And now we want to find operators A12, A21, A22, B1 and B2, so that if we form this uh, two by two block operator matrix, uh, it becomes invertible. Yeah, and, and this is of course the, precisely that block that we had previously. Uh, so if you, can, if you can characterize when this is possible, then you can solve, uh, Previous problem. You can also turn it around. Um, if you if you find a problem here of this type, which doesn't work, you can make some sort of equivalent after extension problem where it also goes wrong. So the, the question here is, um, uh, I mean, the, the difficulty here is is in this problem. 
because the conditions that we have here tell you that there exist invertible operators between these two spaces. The only difficulty here is, is that we have this thing, so we must get it in this form. So it's of interest to see what kind of operators can you get in this uh, thing. And, uh, uh, okay, some easy uh, observations is that it's solvable, for instance, if Z1 and Z2 are isomorphic, that's a simple case because then you take an isomorphism here, and you take all the other things zero, and then you're done. That's easy. And the other case, which is uh, also in a way easy, is when you get all possible operators on P. Yeah, then it's also easy. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. Okay, um, so I'm gonna skip this slide. You can do some analysis on this problem, uh, but I'm not going to I don't have time for that now. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll give you a few results uh, later on, uh, but we ran into the following property and I'll be happy to have some uh, feedback on that. Uh, so we call a bound of space Z stable under finite dimensional quotients of dimension K. If for each subspace uh, of dimension K, Z is isomorphic to the quotient. Uh, and we call it stable under finite dimensional sum dimension K if Z is isomorphic to Z plus whatever bound of space of dimension K you add to it. And uh, this came up in, in what we were doing. It, it seems like a natural condition, but we didn't, didn't find it anywhere. Um, so just a few comments. So all primary bound of spaces are at this property with uh, k equal to one. And then there are a few other results. So um, if uh, it has this property for k, then it also has a property for n times k. Uh, same for, uh, uh, if you have such a space z, you add any space to it, it still has the property. Um, and if you have a finite dimensional subspace, then you can quotient this out and you still have um, but for instance, there exist Banach spaces which have the property for k is equal to two, but for none uh, where k is odd. And that comes from the following result. Um, so the following are equivalent for a Banach space Z. It is equivalent after uh, a stable under finite dimensional quotients of dimension k, stable under finite dimensional uh, sums of dimension k. Uh, there exist federal operators of index k, and then there exist federal operators of so finite. And uh, it turns out that th this was an important property uh, that we needed. And uh, I'm not going to spell out any details of the result, uh, but using that and, and sort of this analysis of uh, this uh, uh, bottom space property, we could get uh, uh, well a bunch of uh, further results where equivalent after extension and sure coupling do coincide. Uh, they're not particularly interesting, I would say. Um, so and we hope to get more interesting results by this, the analysis of this uh, bond of space uh, problem. Uh, but these were sort of things that one could easily get by an analysis in, in analyzing uh, the problem. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. Clap, clap. Um, are there any questions? I think this is the right crew to ask Bonic Space uh, isomorphic questions. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I don't have a background in this, so we ran into all these notions which we had to learn over the last decade. Uh, so, if, if I may ask a question, th this property seems like a very natural property for a Banach space to have. We couldn't find anything in the literature, but you people are the specialists, not me. So. so this is a, a isomorphic to finite dimensional co fi uh, finite co-dimensional spaces, this? Yeah. Um, let's say specific dimension, but if if you make it, if you take k equal oh, one, then specific it dimension, any, right, right. Yeah, but if if it if you have it with dimension, if you take k equal to one, then it becomes all possible uh, dimensions. Uh, right. Okay. Got it. 
And, and, and what's, what, what and we what's found interesting, it, it's the same as existence of Prettholm operators with a given index. And, and there exists a bonic space. Is that is this like the gowers murray examples? Yeah, the... I think so. I mean, yes, it's a hyperplane problem. If you take K, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the last comment here comes from one of their examples because you know they have one of. I mean, there are many papers, but one of them is where they get an, uh, a space where you have all the uh, Prettholm operators of even index. Okay. It's not quite exactly the same as the hyperplane conject, uh, right? Or is it? Do I see this it, wrong? I, I think it's a paper they had later. So they, they have this one famous paper. Oh, I see. This is the math else, and then paper. after that, there were many other papers with, well, other constructions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Leading yeah. to different uh, strange Banach spaces. With, uh, oh, my God. But yeah. Thomas, Thomas, if you look at the definition for k equal to one, right, then the S U F D S yeah. one, that's exactly the hyperplane problem, right? That you take your Banach space Z and right, you add one right. dimension to it and you ask whether that's isomorphic right, to it. Right, right, right. Yeah. So because in this case, between subspace and quotient, it doesn't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Valentin mm -hmm. has some papers like on this, and then there's also some pro papers on like the shorter Bernstein type. I don't know if that's going to be related, but if you have any uh, hints or or relevant, uh, okay. So on them, I would so very much like finite, to know. So let me understand this. Every finite dimension on subspaces of course complemented even if it, yep. it's a bad complement so then isn't this then the is it, so i'm kind of a little bit confused is this is this the same so is so is does this the same mean that every co-dimensional one uh, space is isomorphic to the whole space um i think so yeah yeah, 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 okay. is is one, yeah, right? yeah because you don't have yeah In the, in the case Pablo, the am case I right? <laughs> yes, yes, in, in the Thomas, the, the interesting cases, I think, if I understand, I mean, well, assuming that we are now know the solution to the hyperplane problem, that there are Banach spaces which are not isomorphic to their co-dimension one subspaces, right? Then the yeah. interest, the, the sort of more subtle aspect of this is that you could be isomorphic to those of co-dimension two. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, you could be isomorphic to those of co-dimension 25, but not for any lower code I mentioned, right? Yeah, no. yeah. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know any. Okay, papers. yes, I see what you're saying. It's one direction, it's clear. If you, if you have, yeah. If the Banner space is isomorphic to his hyperplanes, then it satisfies this condition S U F D Q K for every K because you simply. Yeah, right? the, the, the proofs are not very hard. It's just a property that we encountered that we could use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was actually expecting that maybe this is something that people would know and because it seems sort of natural to ask when you have Fredholm operators of, of a certain but yeah, but it's, I think the one the other direction is not this it's not like what like what Neil uh, said it could be isomorphic to subspace of dimension 20 could dimension 25 but not one something like I mean yeah yeah that, that, can, happen. that can happen yeah right yeah I, I suppose. I mean, for two, it can happen. It, it, so that, yeah, right, that's one of those right, papers. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but here's a question about that, that maybe some of the experts will know. So suppose you, um, that you, you know that it has this uh, property for k equal to 25, but no smaller k. And you also know it has the property for k equal to 26. I mean, is that possible? Or does it mean that if you begin at 25, then you must have only the multiples of the 25? <laughs> no, 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 then it's, then it's true for yeah. one. If it's true yeah. for 25 or 26, then it's true for one because. Ah, because one has got to mention one and the other. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but okay. no, yeah, you, don't, yeah, yeah, you don't have yeah. to go from We didn't some do a lot of analysis on this. But you can, uh... I don't see this. Why is it true? If it has, is it true for k equals to two? Why is it then for k equals to one? 
Maybe it's too early in the morning so that I... <laughs> Uh, no, it's not true. If, if it's for k is equal to two, it doesn't have to be true for k is equal to one. Right. No, no, I, exactly. I agree with you. Yes, I completely yeah. agree with you. Okay, so I, I misunderstood you then. Yeah. But yeah. if it's so, true yeah, for no. k at two and three, then ah, it's but true you're for k equals one. Oh, from... that, that you meant. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you can do a bit more than, than uh, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, okay. Doesn't Murray have some notes in which he it does a lot of kind of explanation of these Fred home operators and I, I don't know whether it says any more than his paper with Gowers and his paper with Gowers on this in math and Allen, but I know he has this 70 page note. I mean, I don't know if it's 70 pages, 50 pages of notes where he talks about Fred home operators and all the things you can do with these constructions. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I have it. I can do you work in your thesis on this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was so thinking it's, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, Andrush was so, so it's it's no, that's the most general. So if you have, you can do multi, any multiple of, of a number. So yeah. for any k, there is a space where which is isomorphic to uh, subspace of co-dimension k, but not lower. Uh, you just take the, hmm. the appropriate power of the shift yeah. to generate your ascending group. I think that's right. Okay. If if you have a link to to these notes, I would uh, yeah I could send it. I would really I'll, appreciate. I'll, it. I'll send. I'll definitely send it. Yeah, if I okay. can. I don't. Would be cool. If they're if they exist, I I'm just trying to remember. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have. Is it two minutes to the next speaker? Yeah. I, sorry, I should. Uh, well, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. And, and thank you for the discussion and the feedback. It was really nice. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Bruno. Professor Braga, are you there? Bruno. Yes, I am. How are you guys doing? Uh, ah, hi, good. Bruno. We're good. Hey, Thomas. What's up? Hi, Braga. <laughs> What's up? Are Where you, are you uh, right now? Oh, sorry. I am destroying my cable. Washington, D.C. Like or Kazakhstan. So I am in D.C., actually, yes. Okay. Uh, let me just change my headphones right now because I just noticed one of them is broken. One second. Uh, I'm using my daughter's okay. AirPod Pros. Okay. Now I'm I'm back. Sorry, I was about to start and realized that here is what I was dealing with. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey. So yeah, I am in DC right now. Yeah, I have been here since forever actually. But next week I go to <laughs> Charlottesville for the first time in God knows how long. You got to teach in person. Yeah. Hold on. I should stop. I should pause the recording. Okay. Okay. So I just put it in uh, full screen. Is that full screen for yep. you guys as well? It looks good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Bruno. Uh, okay. Thank you. Force geometry of operator spaces. Okay. So uh, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to be here. It's nice to be at a conference. Uh, I was hoping to be able to actually visit UK in person to a month ago, but then, well, it's too optimistic. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. So I'm going to be talking about course geometry of operator spaces. So for that, my plan is actually, I'm going to spend a couple of slides just uh, recalling the basics. And by the basics, I pretty much mean the definition, actually, of operator spaces. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about course geometry, just mentioning what are the kinds of embeddings and uh, um, equivalences that a course geometer looks at. And then I want to talk about how to try to mix those two things together. And as you guys are going to see, there are, uh, there are three approaches I'm going to present here. One of them fails miserably. The other two, we do have some positive things to say about it. Um, so let's start. Oh, and some of the results are going to be joined with people, but I will mention when, they, when that's the case. Okay, so uh, operator spaces. So the very basics here. So throughout this talk, H is always going to be a Hilbert space. And B of H, uh, the space of bounded operators on H. And by an operator space, what I mean is a closed linear subspace of B of H, okay? So every time I'm talking about an operator space, I am fixing some H and I'm thinking about this guy as being inside of uh, B of H. So if anyone here uh, is not very familiar with operator spaces, you guys may be thinking, well, then what is the difference between an operator space and a bonnet space, right? Because 
Obviously, a closed linear subspace, a Banach subspace of U of H is a Banach subspace, is a, is a Banach space. And if you have a Banach space, of course, it sits inside of some U of H uh, linearly isometrically. So are we just talking about the same objects? And sure, we are, talk oh, sorry. we are talking about the same objects, but actually for us, what changes when you're talking about operator spaces is not really the object itself, but the morphisms you care about. Right. When you're talking about Banach spaces, uh, you're interested in, at least if you're doing the linear theory of operator space, of Banach spaces, you're looking at bounded linear maps uh, between them. Uh, here, we won't be looking at bounded linear maps anymore. We want something stronger that actually respects, that actually takes in consideration not only the space X itself, but actually how it is sitting inside of H. So let's just quickly see how this is done here. So let's say that you start with a set X and a, uh, and a set Y and some natural number N. So by M and X, I'm just denoting the N by N matrices with entries on X. And we're going to be denoting elements in it by things of this sort. Okay, so I have a square matrix in which each entry here is an element of my set X. And if I actually have a map, between x and y. This map also generates canonically a map from the matrix spaces of x to the matrix spaces of y. And this is done by simply computing this coordinate uh, entry-wise. And this map here, f sub index n, is what it's called the nth amplification of your map. OK, so now let's say that you actually start with an operator space. So it's sitting inside of some B of H. Now you are looking at the matrices spaces on X and you want to see each one of those guys here also as a bonnet space. So you also want to have some norm uh, on this space. And this is done in this very natural way here. So what is this? Uh, so since X, X is sitting inside of B of H. Okay, so we look at this B of H. You can take uh, L2 sum of n copies of H, this is what HN is. And then you still have a Hubert space. So you can look at the bounded operators on this Hubert space. So here you have the operator norm in this Bonnet space. Okay, so since those two things here, taking MN of BH or B of H to the N, they are algebraically isomorphically, you can actually transfer the norm that I have in BHN uh, to this little person over here. So this comes in down to this natural norm. And since X is a subset of B of H, MNX becomes a subset of MNBH. So this comes in here, uh, comes uh, with and out of this norm here, just as being a subspace. Okay, so with this uh, background in mind, let's now define what completely bounded maps are. So now you start with a map, a linear map actually, between operator spaces X and Y. So if you look at the amplifications as I had in the previous page of this map, since F is linear, Fn is also linear. So we can talk about the operator norm of Fn. And now what we do is we define what is called the completely bounded norm of F to be the supremum of all such norms. If it happens that this is finite, then we call the map not only bounded, but actually completely bounded. And that's the notion we look at when dealing with operator spaces. So just as we define isomorphisms, we can also define complete isomorphisms, right? So what is this? This is just a linear bijection between the spaces such that the, both the map and the inverse are not only bounded, but they are actually completely bounded. And if you want to talk about a complete isomorphic embedding, well, the same thing, right? It's, it's going to be a complete isomorphism with a, a subspace of the, the target space. Okay, so uh, those are what operator spaces are. Now let's just quickly recall the very basics here of coarse geometry. So in here, I'm just looking at arbitrary metric spaces, but of course, we're going to be looking at operator spaces or at least uh, subsets of operator spaces uh, in what follows. So you look at operator spaces, X and Y, and you consider a map between those. So you have those two moduli over here. But so this omega F is telling you uh, how much the image 
can be far away from each other, given that the points in the domain were at most something away from each other. And here is the opposite. It says how much the points in the image must be far away from each other, given that the points in the domain were at least something specific away from each other. So with those two, with this moduli, we say that the map is coarse if omega f is finite for uh, omega f t is finite for any t. So this is saying that given a specific uh, diameter t in the domain, if I look at the image of a set of diameter at most t, my image will have diameter at most omega f t. So I'm sending bounded things to bounded things and in a uniform way where the uniformity is given by this modulus here. Okay, but this is just a coarse map. If you want now the map to be actually a coarse embedding, you want the map to be coarse, but you also want uh, the inverse and with some quotations here, because it's not really an inverse, right? But you also want the inverse to satisfy a coarse condition. And this is what I call the map itself to be expanding. So here it's saying that if you want to map things to things which are very far away, that's okay, as long as you start with things that were already far away as well in your domain. And now for course equivalences, uh, we just want what, what is a course equivalence? It's just a course embedding whose image is very large in the in the codomain. So we don't really care here in course geometry if the the map is a bijection or not. That's not important. It doesn't need to be injective. It doesn't need to be surjective. Uh, but we just want this largeness condition here to be satisfied. So you want the image to be a let's say an epsilon epsilon dense in the in the codomain for some apps. And just very basic examples here. So in coarse geometry, you don't really care about what is happening in a small scale. So any uh, metric space with bounded diameter is automatically coarsely equivalent to a single point. And if you want some example which isn't of bounded diameter, Z and R, uh, if you just consider the inclusion from Z into R, this is a coarse equivalence. So it takes care of the general shape of the space in in a large sense, but not really locally. Okay, so now, uh, how can we define actually some interesting course theory for operator spaces? And of course, interesting here will, will depend on the on the person, right? But I would say that there is one way which is a pretty natural approach, which is just to proceed to just as we just did a couple of slides ago with uh, completely bounded maps. Let's try to do the same with coarse maps. So you start with a map between operator spaces. Now we, we don't care about the map being linear anymore. So just as we did with the norm, right, with the norm of the Fn's, we look at each amplification. Each amplification uh, has this omega f uh, n uh, module defined. And you can look at the supremum of all of them. And you can say that this is completely coarse if it actually is finite for any t. Here I'm, here, I'm just unfolding the definition, okay, in case someone wants to see what this is. So I'm just saying that there is this uniformity and for every R, I choose some S and I'm sending points which are R close to points which are S close. And this should not depend not only on the points, right, but on N either. So this would be a very natural way for you to try to uh, generalize uh, a coarse notion to an operator space, but this actually fails miserably. This doesn't work. So um, as I have here in this result of uh, Alejandro Chavez Dominguez, uh, if you start with a map between operator spaces, which is completely coarse, so a priori this map has, <laughs> it keeps no track of uh, the linear structure at all, but actually it happens that the map is automatically at least R linear, and not at least R linear, a translation of an R linear map. And uh, here, just one thing, just a quick comment. Uh, throughout this talk, I'm intentionally leaving out the scalar field here. You can consider a, a complex operator spaces or real operator spaces. Uh, the only part in which actually being R linear here is important is here. We cannot, we cannot conclude this is going to be C linear, but we conclude this is going to be at least R linear. Okay, so this is not a good notion, right? You start with you start trying to do nonlinear geometry, and you come and you conclude that your the morphism you define is automatically R linear. So that's that's a big fail. So what can we do? What is the what is a different approach we can try to follow? So for that, what we did was to try to generalize to 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 weaken 
not the condition of the map being completely bounded, but something weaker than the map being completely bounded, which is the following here. So you start with two operator spaces. And now, instead of looking at one map from X to Y and demanding that not only uh, we, we care about embeddings, right? So here I'm giving a definition of embeddings here. So instead of caring about the map being an isomorphic embedding and all the amplifications to be also isomorphic embeddings and the distortion to be uh, bounded, we do that uh, like this. So we don't care about one single map. We look at actually a sequence of maps from X to Y. And in each one of those elements in the sequence, we just want this map to behave well up to some level of the amplifications right so you want once you uh amplify f upper index n n times sure you want it to be uh, an isomorphism with a bounded distortion let's say of k uh, but if you go to n plus one we don't know what happens anymore maybe the distortion will will get very bad so that's a completely trivial remark this is obviously a weaker at least strongly uh sorry at least formally it's a weaker notion than complete isomorphic inventability and actually is strictly strictly weaker there are, we can actually come up with examples of things which almost completely isomorphic and bad but do not completely isomorphic and bad okay so our plan then is to try to proceed just as we did in the previous slide uh to write the natural course version of this statement instead of complete isomorphic inventability and then see if this is going to lead us somewhere so this is what we have here so we say that uh, x almost completely coarsely embeds into y if so now again we don't want a single map f to y to y which is a course embedding and all the amplifications are course embeddings and you have this happening in an equi way we want a sequence of family of a function sorry from x to y such that this sequence of amplifications are equi course embeddings and here i'm just uh unfolding the definitions as well right so what is this saying uh this map fn you have those moduli omega and rho which do not depend on n and you want rho to go to infinity as t goes to infinity and you have this inequality over here happening for all n. okay so uh we have this now new notion of course inventability but of course it may be the case that this also leads us nowhere right so is this interesting now and again what is interesting right but i would say that for a nonlinear notion to be interesting there are at least two things that should happen one of them is this linear notion needs to be actually strictly weaker than the whatever linear counterpart it has right uh, the existence of one nonlinear embedding should not imply the existence of the linear embedding, otherwise, at the end, it won't be very interesting. And the other notion is that it cannot be too weak. <laughs> you cannot say that everything embeds everywhere, right? It does not record, uh, it's, not, does not, it's not capable of recovering any aspects of the linear structure. Otherwise, again, you, you, you make things too, too weak and uninteresting. So, can we say that our new definition satisfies those two items? Well, happily we do. Uh, I'm not going to mention much about it. I'm just going to give some quick examples here because I want to talk about a different notion of inventability. But uh, for item one, we can actually, uh, using the machinery of Lipschitz free spaces, we can actually come up with examples of operator spaces X and Y. So that X almost completely coarsely embed into Y, but X does not embed into Y not even as a bound space. So in particular, it does not embed almost completely isomorphically either. And uh, for two, there are actually several examples we have for uh, showing that the geometry is preserved sometimes. But let me just mention one here, which is this one. So if you have uh, an uh, infinite dimensional operator space and you assume that it almost completely coarsely embed into PCA's operator space, operator Hubert space OH, which I, I won't give the definition of what OH is. Um, it's a operator space which is completely isometric as a Bonnex, sorry, is isometric as a Bonnex space to Lear all two. 
uh, and satisfy some nice properties. So it's the anyway, it's the the L2 version is the, the, the non-commutative version of L2 in operator spaces. And if X, if an arbitrary operator space almost completely coarsely embeds into OH, then actually needs to be completely isomorphic to OH. So this nonlinear notion actually does keep track of the geometry of OH in this very strong way. Okay, but uh, there are actually, let me just come back here. There are actually two problems. So uh, as I said, those are the, let's say the minimum two conditions we would like to have for this non availability uh, thing to be interesting, but there are obviously more items you can add here. And I want to add one item which respects to this thing here. Unfortunately, the only examples we can come up for to show that this is actually a strictly weaker notion are non separable examples, which is a bit frustrating. So, can we come up actually with separable examples? This would be one thing we would like to do. And the other thing is that at least we cannot uh, come up with examples of nonlinear equivalences, which are not trivial, of course, but only of embeddings. So how can we try to fix um, those two problems? And uh, this is a, the third notion I mentioned that I want to introduce here of, uh, let's say, an operator space course embeddability. So this notion here, it's pretty similar to the one I had before, but now I have my maps defined only on balls, okay? And that's why I'm just adding this word here to the definition. So now I'm not talking about a com almost complete course embedding anymore, but an almost complete course embedding of bounded subsets. So we say that given operator space X and an operator space Y, we say that the bounded subset, uh, subsets of X almost completely course embedding to Y if now we have the sequence of maps, but not from the entire X, just for those balls into Y. And you want those amplifications here to be equi course embedded. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, so first thing, we have now this notion, and of course, question one and two is still <laughs> need to hold for this, otherwise uh, we are doing something silly. So let me just quickly observe that this actually is the case. For this notion being strictly weaker than it's nonlinear. It's linear version. It's trivial, right? Because this is actually weaker than the nonlinear embeddability I just presented before. So if the nonlinear embeddability I had before was already strictly weaker, so is this. So that one is fine. And for uh, the question of whether this notion is not too weak and it still captures some of the geometry, actually the same result on OH minor some simple modifications. We can actually retain the same result for this. So if you have an operator space X and the bounded subsets of it almost completely coarsely embedded to OH, actually X needs to be completely isomorphic to OH already. Of course, an infinite dimensional uh, space. Okay, so what about new things then that we can do with this, with this notion? So let me just mention uh, another uh, preservation of the geometry here that happens. Uh, with the row and the column space. So for this, let me just quickly recall here what they are. So if you look at little l2 uh, and you look at the bound operators on little l2, you can always think about them as infinite matrices. And the row space is the, the space consisting of all the bounded operators on little l2, such that once you look at its representation as a matrix, all its rows are zero except the first one. And uh, the column space, the same thing, but the first column cannot be, doesn't need to be zero, but all the other columns need to be zero. So they are both, uh, as Banach spaces, they are both just little l2, but as operator spaces, the structure changes quite a bit. Uh, here now, uh, again, because of time, I cannot really mention what the interpolation is, so I'm just going to leave it like this. Uh, for any theta, this is going to be a different operator space. And I'm just going to mention that uh, they, they, those operator spaces are all uh, Hilbertians. They are all just as one spaces. And if you don't know what the interpolation spaces are, just consider theta equals zero and theta equals one, because then in this case, you have this nice uh, equivalence here. So you can just consider this case specifically. But what the result I want to mention is that uh, if you have two different uh, indices here, theta and gamma, and you look at the theta interpolation and the gamma interpolation, then they are actually incomparable 
uh, with respect to this weaker notion of course embeddability. Okay, so those this is a family of spaces which, as a bonnet space, they are just Lear well two. There, so nothing is changing. They're actually the same space, but as operator spaces, they are different. And this weaker notion actually is strong enough to capture the difference in the operator space structure of those two things. Okay, and now what about uh, the two problems three and four that I wanted to fix? Right, I wanted to have examples of uh equivalences not only of embeddings and examples happening in the separable world so let's see here so first what would be the equivalence right i didn't write it before but this is what i'm calling an equivalence in this scenario here so i'm considering now a sequence of bijections from x to y and i'm considering that once you restrict to the balls you're restricting F and GZ, GNs to the balls, you have equicourse embeddings. I know that's, I mean, that, that's not the previous definition ever. Uh, there are too many indices here, but well. So in this, what can we do? So this uh, gives us a solution for three and four in the following way. So I can find separable operator spaces X and Y, so that X as a Bonnach space does not embed into Y. But actually, they do have the same uh, bounded subspaces, uh, bounded subsets, sorry, almost completely porcel. And I'm going to mention a little bit about how to obtain this result here now. I I'm going to give the method that's actually a method of Calton. I'm not going to say anything about why the method works, but I'm at least going to show you what the method is. Okay, so how can we do this thing here? So you start by looking at a quotient map. Okay, so you have two operator spaces, y and x, and you have a completely bounded map from y to x, which is also a quotient map as a Bonnach space. Okay, this, if it's a quotient map as an operator space, even better, but we, we don't care about that. It's not necessary. So now uh, you can give this uh, sequence of equivalent norms to y by defining it like this. Okay, so I'm looking at this uh, multiplication here, this scale scalar multiple of the norm of y, and then I'm considering what happens in x by q like this. And this not only gives us a equivalent norm on y, but actually gives us some equivalent operator space structure on y, which you can define it like that. Okay, this is going to give us a way for us to compute the norms in here. And while I didn't mention, but for you to actually show that this gives rise to a nice operator space, of course, you use Ruan's theorem, but let, let me just skip the details here but this does indeed give rise to a, an operator space structure on y so now you have this sequence of spaces of operator spaces ym and each one of them is not completely isometric but completely isomorphic to y so what we do now is you look at the l1 sum of all those spaces when you look at the l1 sum of all those spaces let's call this ZQ following Kalpan's notation, you still have this natural quotient map uh, from ZQ to X. And what we can show is that, uh, well, here I'm just repeating everything. I start with the operator spaces X and Y. I have a completely bounded map, which as a map between Bonnach spaces is also a Bonnach quotient. Then I consider the things above, then those two spaces here, regardless of what the space, what the quotient map you started with is, they have the same bounded subsets according to almost complete force equivalence. And that, oh, actually I should have mentioned, but I didn't. This is actually the method that Calton used to provide the first example of Bonnet spaces, which are coarsely equivalent to each other, but not uniformly equivalent to each other. But okay, so once you do that, then you have this property here. So now if you want to have that those two spaces are far from each other, right? Like different from each other in any other uh, way. So for example, linearly, uh, you just need to play around with which quotient maps you have. So you can actually guarantee that they are not equivalent to each other in whatever notion you want. And 
well, whatever you do, they're always going to be equivalent to each other in this specific notion. So if you want to have uh, spaces X and Y, which are equivalent with respect to this nonlinear notion, but let's say this space here does not embed into here as a Banach space, one thing you can do is you can just start with a quotient of L1 onto C0, and this will be enough. Because here then X would be C0, but this would be a sure space since it's a L1 sum of uh, isomorphic copies of L1, and then you would have this incompatibility. Okay, uh, so, but there is actually, let me just go back a little bit to emphasize that part. So there is actually in this result that I just uh, spent some slides talking about, there is something a bit frustrating, at least to me, which is this first item here. So sure, those two spaces we obtain, uh, they are equivalent with respect to this nonlinear notion, and they are not with respect to the linear notion. But the restriction to linear embeddability actually happens in the Banach level, which I, I, I mean, it's nice to have restrictions which are actually truly operator spacey, right? So can we actually come up with examples in which the problem is not happening in the Banach level, but actually in the operator space level? And actually we can in a way, although as I mentioned, the very last problem, there is still something I can't do. So how to come up with an operator space restriction here? So one way of doing this is to look at the space uh, R intersect C. So here I'm just giving the definition of R intersect C. Okay, so what is R intersect C? Uh, I am looking at R, I am looking at C. I take the, soup, uh, the, the direct sum of them with the max norm. This becomes an operator space. And now I look at the image of little L2 inside of R plus C, where this, those maps here are just the canonical maps, uh, the canonical linear isometries with R and C. So this is a, the image of this map is a subspace of R plus C. And this subspace is what we call R intersect C. Okay, so with this subspace, uh, it's known in the literature that you do have actually a complete quotient map from L infinity to R intersect C. And we actually can prove, and okay, just uh, I should have written here, this is actually a result that was obtained in a conversation with Timur uh, Oikberg. Um, so I apologize for that. And okay, let, let me just say, so here is what my Z Q will be, right? So what we're doing here, we, are, I, I, we show that R intersect C cannot embed completely isomorphically into any L1 sum of spaces which are isomorphic as Banach spaces to L infinity. Using this result, we can obtain this thing here. So we can find operator spaces X and Y, and this time they're not separable anymore, unfortunately, but we can find operator spaces X and Y with the property that, so now, in the Banach level, they are good. X still isomorphically embeds into Y, but they do not, X does not isomorphically, uh, completely isomorphically embed into Y. And they still have uh, equivalent bounded subsets according to this nonlinear notion. Okay, so this is still not exactly what I wanted. I would like to have a strengthening of this result which is this missing example I'm listing here. So problem, can you find operator spaces X and Y such that X isomorphically embeds into Y, but X does not almost completely isomorphically embed into Y, but so that this is the case. And this uh, almost word here, I couldn't, I couldn't do yet. And that's it. I don't have time anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno. I always appreciate uh, refreshing the definitions of operator spaces and uh, all these uh, morphisms. Um, so 
I speak for myself in that. Thank you. Uh, because I, I always feel like I spend way too much time in the beginning, but then if I don't do that, I feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, I know. Uh, oh, hey, Mark. Some, uh, hello. Uh, so I know you have some papers concerning the complexity of, uh, uh, in the sense of invariant descriptive set theory. So I wonder whether you uh, uh, were thinking about the complexity of your equivalences given in, during mm, this talk. Actually, no. It, did, it never crossed my mind to right now. <laughs> no, uh, I haven't worked with that. No. So even for completely bounded isomorphisms, right? You don't know what is the complexity of this relation for separable, I mean, operator spaces. I honestly never thought about it, but I would imagine for a complete bounded isomorphisms should be not much different than the ones in the Banach space scenario, right? But uh, to be well, honest, I, I never I thought about this question I too. There is, a, there is a paper about it. There is a paper of uh, Sabo, Kalantar, Kennedy, and so on, on the complexity of completely bounded isomorphism for operator spaces. Okay. and. It, do you remember? If, is this, does anything different happen from the the Bonnet case? There? I think it's the same. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and sorry, can you say the name of the author again, just for me to take a look? Uh, I mean, there were like uh, six authors because I think it was a result of, of some Banff uh, Banff meeting. So, uh -huh. uh, Sab Martin Sabok. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, this one. Okay. And uh, Martina Lupine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if, if I if I can, I just I'm just wondering to ask uh, if you need to work in the general generality of uh, course maps, or you can, like in the Banach case, you can replace it with some uh, almost completely quasi isometric maps, right? Because uh, in mm -hmm. Banach's case, course course embeddability implies quasi quasi isometric embeddability, right? So but, sorry, but, you're just asking like to change course by other notions, like I don't know, uniform yeah, or yeah, lip sheets, no, course I mean, lip I mean, I mean, let, let's say if, if course automatically implies uh, some quasi-isometric. Uh, uh, if, if, if you're talking just about the map itself being uh, course, yes, it will be in the same way to be uh, course lip sheets as well, or as you're saying, I guess, quasi quasi uh, isometry no, sometimes yeah. people say, right? Yes. Oh, okay. And is it, is it true also like in the Banach case that uh, if you have, let's say, two uh, almost completely uh, coarse uh, isomorphic uh, operator spaces, then some ultra powers are uh, completely isomorphic or something? So, like yeah. So uh, what actually, like, this is a good thing. So what, this is actually how we do. Sorry. This <laughs> with o -O right? this, this with OH, right? Yeah, yeah, the OH. Yeah. We do that with ultra powers, exactly, yeah. So this, sorry, let me get there somewhere. I will eventually get there. Uh, did I pass? I think I passed. Yes, okay. So this OH thing here is doing exactly like that. We are looking at even, even this weaker, yeah, even this weaker, this stronger, sorry, stronger result here. We're doing exactly with ultra powers, as you're saying. You're taking the ultra powers off those maps here. And in the ultra power, it's going to be defined everywhere. And you can actually get a map, which is uh, just as you have for Banach spaces, which is going to be a Lipschitz, uh, a Lipschitz embedding into the ultra power. But since you have now something very, uh, a, com a complete Lipschitz embedding, and since you have now a complete Lipschitz embedding, because of this other result of ours here, the map actually needs to be R linear. And then you have the, the embeddings you want. But yeah, that's that's the that's the gist of what we're doing for OH. That's how we get this very strong complete isomorphic embeddability to OH. So yes, you, you can play around with ultra powers just as you do in Banach spaces. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Thank you all. Nice Bye. to see the family fa friendly faces of Merrick and Michael. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, the next speaker is Christina. Is it at 920? Is that the, I, I'm probably the one that should know this, but I think it's at 920. Oh, nice to see you, Christina, as well, by the way. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you too. <laughs> Christina, did you sign in as the, oh, I see you twice. You're good. Yes. Okay. So the one which on? has no, 
no sound so, is Sapir is the Saspiro. one that... <laughs> okay we'll just take a few minutes and then Um, great. Okay, so the last uh, last speaker of the session today is Christina Breck, uh, speaking on isometries of combinatorial spaces. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, Kevin, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. It's not uh, exactly, I hope you enjoy the talk, but it's maybe a bit... Um, not on the exact topic. Um, most of what I will talk about is about the joint work with uh, Claribet Pinha, but also with uh, Valentin Ferenzi and Adit Kachuk. So um, the motivation was this theorem, which I guess is folklore, um, that every linear isometry of, the, of C0 and also of the LPs for P different than two, um, are a, permi a sign permutation of the canonical basis. So you have a bijection of the natural numbers and a sequence of signs. Signs are just uh, uh, scalars with absolute value one, and uh, such that the basis is taken by T to this signed permutation. And also, I like to put as a motivation some sort of um, topological counterpart, right, which is the Banaston theorem, where um, it says that if you have two compact Hausdorff spaces and a linear isometry um, between C of K and C of L, then it is induced by a homeomorphism between K, uh, K and L. Um, whenever I say in this talk isometry, I mean linear bijective isometry. Okay, so um, just to be to be clear, but I won't repeat it all the time. And so uh, indeed, Kevin, uh, when we visited um, Virginia in I think it was 2018, maybe. Um, pose this question, what are the isometries of the Schreier spaces? So in the Schreier families and the Schreier spaces I def are defined as follows. So the first Schreier family, the classical one, which was introduced by Schreier in the 30s, is just the families of finite subsets. So this means uh, finite subsets of the natural numbers, which has less elements than its minimum. Okay, so uh, and, and this condition is just some technicality. But uh, important to understand the family is that, so you have uh, finite sets as large as you want in the family, but the larger you want it, the further it has to start, right? The minimum has to be also large. And, and then you can take the completion of C00. So you take just the vector space of finitely supported sequences of, of real or complex numbers with respect to this norm. So you, take, you are allowed to take sums of absolute values of the coordinates as far as they are um, supported in some uh, set of the family, of the Schreier family in this case. So this is a norm. And, and you, you can take, sorry, and you can take the completion of this space and then you get a banner space. Um, there are also sort of more complex versions of the Schreier family, which are the Schreier families of higher orders. So if you take a countable board, you know, you can sort of make some interpolation here. So you take elements of the previous family and you take finite unions of them. And these finite unions are restricted to some condition related to the, the first Schreier family. And so this is how you define the Schreier families for, for successor ordinals. And then for limit ordinals, you sort of take uh, tails of, of, the, of Schreier families of some sequence converging to, to the limit ordinal, and you take the union of them. I mean, 
you have to take, I will mention why you have to take tales of these families and just to point out that the, the increasing sequence converging to alpha might change. So for as alpha is not really um, one family, I mean, you, you can have several definitions for some, some as alpha, some Schreier family of some limit ordinal. Uh, oh, here should be, yeah, the other S. Anyway, and, and similarly, we can take again the same, exactly the same norm um, and the completion of the C00 with this norm and you get a banana space. Um, so what are the important properties of these families which allow us to, to consider these banana spaces and which give uh, some interesting properties of the banana space? So one condition is that these families contain singletons. This is not really needed. You could, um, this is helpful to guarantee that the norm previously defined is really a norm, but you could just uh, take the supremum uh, considering also the, the um, uh, maximum of the coordinates and then you would so this condition, we could get rid of it, but we, I will just put it because it is useful and the singletons will play some role later. So uh, if you don't have it, you can just add them. Um, it is hereditary. This is also a condition that it's not really needed because you can always close under subsets. So when I say that these families are hereditary, I mean that if I have one element here and then I take a subset of it and then it is still in the family, uh, but as I said, if I have a family with the other properties that I will uh, that I will impose, I can just take the closure under subsets and I get a hereditary family. So these two conditions they will appear, but I mean, it, it's just because without loss of generality, I can assume I have these two properties and they are helpful. I mean, they make uh, arguments easier to write. Um, and then as alpha is also compact family, um, so we look at this family as a subset of the contour set, we just associate, uh, so if I have some uh, element of S alpha, I just associate it to its, its characteristic function here. So I can see this as a subset of the contour set, and then I just, um, the family is compact if it is compact as, as with this topology, with the inherited topology from the contour uh, space. And finally, these families, these Schreier families, they are all spreading. Um, so spreading is a condition which says that the family is closed and they're pushing elements to the right. So if I have one element of the family and I take larger um, integers corresponding to each of them, then I still get an element of the family. So the Schreier families have all these properties and this guarantee, this guarantee, this properties guarantee that the, the, the canonical basis um, the, the, of the C00 is indeed a one unconditional Schauder basis of the corresponding Schreier spaces and which is also shrinking. So as I said, um, the most important here is that the family is compact to guarantee that this uh, shoulder basis is shrinking. This will be what I will mostly use. Um, okay. So what are the combinatorial banana spaces? So these are just a generalization of the Schreier uh, spaces. So now I take an index set I, which doesn't have to be the natural numbers, but um, for the separable um, context, is, it is the, the natural numbers. And then I take a family of uh, finite subsets of I. So they, all the elements of F are finite. And then I can, I say that it has the corresponding uh, properties that I just checked that the Shire families have if they, have, if they uh, satisfy the, the, the condition that we just mentioned. So it, it is hereditary if it is closed under subsets, it is compact. If I again associate to each element of the family F, I can associate its characteristic function. 
and and then I look uh, to F as a subset of this um, space two to the i, and it is compact if it is closed as a subset of two to the i. And spreading is a condition which. Um, makes good sense uh, whenever I have the, the whenever I'm working in the natural numbers. For instance, if I is some larger ordinal, we could also, so if we have some order in I, right, in particular, if you have a, an ordinal or a cardinal, it makes sense. I mean, it is formally possible to define what a spreading family is, but it is not very helpful, in particular, if you are working with uh, larger infinite um, ordinals or cardinals, uh, spreading and compact properties are incompatible. So if you have a spreading family, it won't be compact. And so since I need compactness for what I will do, um, I will restrict the notion of spreading to the context of the natural numbers. Um, and just to, to put it shortly, a regular family is a family which is hereditary, compact, and spreading. And in general, I, I'm also assuming that all the singletons belong to the family. I just could add them, and it keeps all these, these, um, these properties. Um, so having a, combi a, a family with these properties, I can define now a norm on the C00 of I, so I have now sequence, larger sequences indexed on the larger set I. And so if I take a finitely supported sequence in C00 of I, then I define the norm similarly, taking allowing sums of uh, absolute values for, um, for whenever they are indexed in some elements of the family. And because the family has all these properties, again, this is, uh, okay, then I take the completion of this um, norm space, I get a Banach space, and, and this is, um, it will have, again, the E, now the EIs, so let me put here EI. This will be a shoulder basis, um, a long shoulder basis, which has similar properties as previously. So it will be, whenever I have a cardinal, maybe it's better to write it in a cardinal so that I have an order here. But if I have something like this, then this will be a one unconditional shoulder basis for this uh, banana space, and it will be also shrinking. Um, so, okay, um, the motivation for, well, my motivation for Kevin's question is that uh, C0 can be seen as a combinatorial space, right? If we just take the family of the singletons, this family satisfies uh, all these properties. And if you take the supremum allowing only sums over singletons, you just get the supremum norm. And so combinatorial banana spaces are a natural generalization of C0 of C0. And, and also C0 of some kappa or some gamma for some larger index set gamma. Um, so we wanted to know what are the isometries of these spaces. So the main results, um, I put here several versions, I will um, comment on each of them, but is that if you have an isometry between two combinatorial uh, Banner spaces, then you have a bijection of the index set, right? So you have F and G families with the same uh, underlying uh, index set. Um, then there, so there is a bijection of this index set and a family of signs, so that T is always a sign permutation of the, the basis. And so for hereditary and compact families F and G with some additional properties. So let me mention what are the, the versions. Oh yes. So, and moreover, this permutation will take one family onto the other. Okay, so this is, um, it will, I will use it later. So the first version um, by Antunes, Binland and Shu was that if you have a Schreier family of finite order, both on the domain and counter domain, 
So whenever you have um, an isometry of one of the Schreier spaces for a finite order, then you can get uh, this permutation. And indeed, I will also mention later, but this permutation in, in that case is just the identity map. Um, later, uh, together with uh, Ferenczi and Kachuk, we got the same result, but now for F and G not necessarily being the same, uh, but they are regular families on N. So we have, so in particular, when I say regular here, the important additional property is that it has, uh, it is spreading, right? So, and this is the version together with them. And then later with Claribet Pinha, we proved uh, the same, but we generalized in particular for um, uncountable index sets. So, and then we had exactly the problem by which property do we have to replace the spreading property, right? Because on, on N, we always, we, we assumed uh, spreading and that was useful in the proof. So we had to find out what was the, the condition to replace. And, and the condition is this one, that the singletons of I, they are in the closure of the maximal elements of the family. So ma when I say maximal, I mean maximal with respect to the inclusion. And so the singletons, they are in the closure of the maximal elements of the family. And this is true for regular families, for spreading families, because whenever you, ha you, you have some singleton N here, and then if it is not maximal, I mean, you can extend it to some maximal um, element. And, and usually you can assume that it is the minimum. So you will uh, extend it to some maximal element so that it is the minimum. And then you can push these other elements at, in this direction and get a disjoint uh, set here such that this is still the minimum, for instance. And and then push it again. So you get a sequence here of maximal elements and, and it, if needed, you can also enlarge the set to get it to be maximal. Um, but you can, so you, by pushing using spreading, you get a sequence of, uh, of, of sets such that the intersection of two of them is only this N. So exactly you have this singleton being in the closure of these maximal elements. Okay, and so this is how we figured out what was the needed condition to prove uh, in the uncountable context. So just to mention some non-separable examples, right? Because I gave as a motivation the, the Schreier families uh, in, in, on N. So for larger sets, we have some interesting constructions of uh, spaces, um, coming from this family, so combinatorial spaces or combinatorial norms, um, which give interesting properties. So let me first mention this result by Lopez Abad and Todorcevic, um, which says that if a coloring from finite subsets of some cardinal, infinite cardinal kappa in two colors, uh, it witnesses that kappa is not an omega erdos cardinal. I won't, I mean, the definition is almost what is, is written here, but um, uh, I won't uh, give the definition, but this is some combinatorial uh, uh, definition for a cardinal. So uh, again, a coloring witnesses that this cardinal is not omega erdos if and only if this family uh, oh, here it's not uh, really correct. Okay. If, if a family coming from the coloring, so here instead of all the finite subsets, I should say that all the finite subsets, all, all the finite, all the subsets of F with the same size have the same color. So it's not for all of them, but just when you have a fixed, uh, any fixed size here. So this family is hereditary, compact, and large. And large means exactly that you have finite sets, but of arbitrarily large size. Um, so this is uh, an equivalent uh, condition. And, and they also prove that this is equivalent to having a Banach space with a one unconditional basis, uh, which has uh, no, subsymmetric sequences. And 
Okay, so this is just one family which appears and it has all the, the properties we want. And also in a joint work with them, we considered, for, in, for example, I mean, in this paper, we constructed some version of the, um, of the non-separable version of the citizen space. And we used this sort of families in there. Uh, of course, our space that is much more complicated than just the combinatorial space of one family. We make some interpolation of families there. But uh, just to give you an idea, if we have a family with these properties living on some cardinal kappa, and indeed you can assume it lives in the, in the ordinal, which is the successor of kappa, then you can push this further and get a, a, a uh, family with the same properties, but on a larger cardinal. So you will get from, from a family on a, a cardinal kappa, we get a family on the cardinal two to the kappa by using the uh, complete binary tree and pushing. So the, just to... <clears throat> so here I have um, the kappa, and so I have my family living here, and I push it here by just taking elements which are in the branches such that the images belong to the family here. So this is how I push a family from some kappa to the two to the kappa and get families, interesting families in larger and larger cardinals. So this slide is just to mention that the, the non-separable case has also interesting examples. Um, so what are the ingredients uh, for the, the, those theorems? Um, so what we do is just, um, oh, I, th I thought maybe I have, oh, I corrected, but I don't have the corrected version here. I'm sorry, anyway. So um, we look at the, if, if we fix an isometry between these combinatorial spaces, we look at the, at the adjoint operator, and this is also an isometry. So, and there is this characterization of the extreme points of the dual bow of combinatorial spaces by Gowers, which says that the extreme points of the dual bow, and here is what I corrected, but I have again the, the wrong version. Here is just the sums, um, the index, the, the, um, sign sums of the of things like this so uh i take here sign possible signs and i take the the since my basis is shrinking now i have this basis in the dual and then i i take these elements and whenever i have such a sum which is indexed by a maximal element this is an extreme point of of the dual ball and these are all the extreme points and so isometries taking extreme points to extreme points, this already gives you that such sums have to go onto the same kind of sums on the other side, right? And then you have to work in order to get from a finite sum to get rid of it and, and just get uh, what is the image of uh, a singleton right, like a, of one element of the basis. And this is done in, in, the, in our first version, is done just by hand, sort of, we work by hand, so to get from these sums into, so the, the image, right, of this element to get what are the images of this element. And then with Claribet, we managed to state it, to write it in a more elegant way, I guess, which, which says, which uses the fact that uh, these uh, singletons are um, in the closure of maximal elements of the family. So you can approximate these elements of the basis by extreme points. And then in the weekly star topology, and then sort of use the, the isometry to, to write this one. Okay, and just a comment um, in here, I will put a question and it might have a stupid answer, but I don't really know. So I, maybe someone in the audience can help me. Um, so in, in the previous version, um, we can start directly with an isometry on the on the dual spaces 
Okay, while uh, with Claribet, we needed to, we needed this isometry to be weekly star, weekly star continuous. So this is why we finally started with an isometry between the combinatorial spaces and, and then worked with the adjoint operator. But we don't know if this is just the same, right? If every isometry from the duo of a combinatorial space to the duo of a combinatorial space is always weekly star, weekly star continuous or something like that. So if someone would know, please let me know at the end. And then a further analysis of these um, objects. Um, as I said, I mentioned when I stated the main result in these uh, various versions that uh, for the Antunes, Binland and Shu version, where they have uh, the Schreier family to, sorry, the, the family to be one of the Schreier families of uh, finite order, uh, they showed that the permutation is the identity, right? So, and in our version with Ferenc and Kachuk, we also get that the permutation is the identity uh, whenever I have any Schreier family of, of any uh, order. So, what about regular families, right? So can this permutation, uh, what can we say about the permutation? Because we know that the isometry comes from a permutation, but now what are the, the allowed permutations say? And also what about the non-separable case? Um, so um, then we proved that uh, in the general case, if we have a, bi if we have a bijection between here I stated with the cardinal, but could be an index set, um, which takes one family, one of those families onto the other. Um, it will be the identity map as far as I know that um, this, the counter Bendixson rank of the singletons in these families is increasing, which for some for some similar reason that I mentioned uh, when I said that you can push sets to the right and construct a sequence here, such that the singleton will be in the closure uh, of this, will be the limit indeed of these sets. So for some similar reason for spreading families, uh, the counter Bendixson ring index of the singletons is, um, is it's not, it's not necessarily increasing, but it's already non-decreasing. So this is, uh, um, and for the Schreier families, they are increasing. So, uh, so and, and, and this can be done even in the non-separable non context, right? So the, the condition is that the singletons um, have to have counter Bendixson um, rank increasing in both families, then it has to, to, to send, um, P has to be the identity map. Actually, so this comes, I mean, we, we managed to, to realize this because indeed, whenever I have this bijection P here, I have uh, um, an induced homeomorphism between two to the kappa and two to the kappa or two to the i or two to the r or between the, the counter set and the counter set. And this, and this homeomorphism is taking one family onto the other. So it is a homeomorphism of the families themselves. And then, so we extracted the topological um, information about the families. And finally, I mean, this is a um, more combinatorial result of the same work, but we managed to prove that um, if, if a family is taken by a permutation onto another family, whenever it is spreading, so this is because we wanted to know what spreading families, what can we say about spreading families, because this is a rather strong condition in this context. And then indeed the permutation might not be the identity map, but the family has to be the same. So this means that um, you cannot have two different combinatorial spaces coming from, a, from spreading families, which are isometric, right? I mean, the family has to be exactly the same. And we were hoping with this that, um, so spreading families would give us representatives of um, isometric classes um, 
of combinatorial banana spaces in the countable setting, but uh, it is not true. I mean, there are compact hereditary families um, on N, which cannot be permuted into a regular one, so into a spreading one. And then, so the, the, the regular ones don't give representatives of all possible combinatorial spaces in the, in the, cont in the countable context. And just to mention two questions, so we could do, instead of putting just sums of absolute values, we can put sums of uh, absolute values with uh, P norms over there. And so do similar results hold um, for these norms? And also, what about the non-surjective linear isometries between these spaces? I mean, because of course, this is a very rigid structure which we considered, right? So. Uh, what can be said if we uh, take something uh, weaker? And okay, here are all the, the references and this is all. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Christina. I have some uh, comments or uh, mm -hmm. a couple questions, but if, if any, anybody else has a question, mine are more comments. I don't hear anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for the nice talk. I appreciated uh, hearing the overview. And um, <clears throat> so something I was I was thinking about a while back, and I meant to ask you about maybe some further research type of thing is that there are some papers where they're looking at the uh, characterizing the isometries between the spheres. Um, and so, for example, there's something called Tingley's extension problem or something like this, which is if you have isometries between the spheres of bonic spaces, can they always be, uh, are they always the restriction of isometries between the spaces? And so uh, for a few spaces like James space and Cyrilson space, they've looked at there are some uh, some papers on which they characterize the isometries on the spheres of these space these spaces and essentially show that the isometries on the spheres have the exact same um, structure as the uh, characterization of the isometries on the spaces, but the techniques are quite different because you're not looking at the it's only on the sphere, so it's a linear the linear structure sort of goes away. It's just uh, mm -hmm. onto isometries on the sphere, so. It might be interesting in, to look at uh, that um, in combinatorial spaces as well, um, because it seems to me that the techniques don't quite work the same way. And uh, there's also the possibility that you could say something interesting. I mean, I think that there's some general questions about these whether you can extend these isometries on the spheres to the whole spaces and. You know, and it might be with different combinatorial spaces that you could you could say something in that kind of area. But um, that was just some thoughts I was having about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is. You can think of these families also from ju just a topological point of view, right? I mean, when you don't have look so much into the order, or and and then I mean, exactly. That's why I put the Banastone theorem at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Because you. You can also, so so if you can also think, so if C of one of these families and is isometric to C of the other one, then they are mm. homeomorphic. But in both cases, the linearity, I mean, shows up right in the proofs. I mean, in the classical mm -hmm. Bernstein theorem, and here also the the fact we are using strongly the fact that the extreme points are taken uh, to extreme points, and this yeah. of course uses linearity, right? So yes, but I mean, it's. Um, I also think there must uh, be because these these are rather well behaved. Families. I mean, from my point of view, I think most people look at them as uh, maybe something um, strange. But for mm -hmm. me, this uh, they are very rigid. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, uh, I, Christina. I have a question. So you said you can prove. I forgot now exactly what it was. Uh, you can prove something for finite Schreier uh, order Schreier spaces, but not for. No, yes. for. 
I mean, the same results hold. It's just that. Uh, ah, no, okay. So, sorry, it's omega one. Oh, okay. So, no, no, no. I, I misread. <laughs> I thought omega. Oh, because there's a lot <laughs> yeah, of. Yeah, no. The right. first version was for finite orders, right? With, yeah. with Kev, Kevin, and. and yeah, and Thomas. Right. We, we were proving for. We didn't think to go to the duel, and we proved it on the space, and things yeah. got really out of hand at, at omega. And. Uh, and uh, because, when you go to yeah. the duel, things get a, a much, uh, a good bit simpler. I, I don't want to say it's simple, but it was it was it was definitely a bit easier. So no, um, I'm asking this because I don't know. Do you know this paper by Gasparis and Leon in 2000? They uh, found continue many complemented spatial subspaces of. Uh, of Schreier space, but only in the finite, only in the fi uh, for finite order and uh, they find con they found continuum many what say again uh, continuum many complemented spa spatial subspaces complemented spatial sub uh, spatial subspaces means uh, generated by subsequence of the basis, mm -hmm. but they can only do this. I actually, looked at that and I tried to generalize it, but I couldn't either. Uh, they only could do it for Schreier spaces of finite order, not of mm -hmm. infinite order. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it also has to do with uh, uh, about the ideals of operators. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder whether there's a similar reason why <laughs> in your case, it's yeah. it's more difficult or uh, the, so I wonder about. Well, probably if you go with the basis, it is more difficult for a similar reason, but they were smart enough to go to the dual and uh, work with oh, the, I see. the okay. extreme points on this. So they sort of, because of the problem they were trying to solve, were able to go to the duel and deal with the, because the problem is you don't know the extreme points on the space, characterizing oh, the extreme points on the Stryer space is, as far as I can tell, very hard. Okay, so this um, was actually, oh yeah, I see. This is also in your paper with, uh, with mm -hmm. Tomash and Niels, you had, you had this yeah. restriction, right? Yeah, yeah, right. That, that's why we had that restriction. Yeah. So from mm -hmm. what I know, so okay, so uh, speaking about the number of ideals of, of on Schreier spaces, I don't know yet whether this can be generalized for for infinite order. So Kevin, you don't know whether your result. No, no, we absolutely use the. Yeah, no, no, I think no, I know. I I, I thought yeah. about this too, and I. There is a there is a problem, right? <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. In fact, yeah. I thought about this problem that you mentioned. And then think about it very much. And then months later, you mentioned that you thought about it and try to overcome this omega barrier, if you will. And uh, I hadn't realized it was going to be that hard. No, no, <laughs> so, I, I, it, it yeah. looks it looks doable, right? But then, uh, <laughs> yes, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a recent paper by Piotr Borodulina Jaya and Barnabas Farkas. Uh, where they also look to ideals of these um, uh, of operators of these spaces yeah. of the Schreier spaces. Because okay, uh, so I, I know, yeah, so I thought, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I think it's published. Oh okay, but it's also on the archive. Yes. Yeah. Okay, what, so what? there's yeah. It's, so I, it only reminded me when you had this distinction also. So I, I was wondering whether there's some. Yeah, here there is no distinction on the on the on the result. Yeah. There is just yeah. a distinction on the difficulty because yeah, yeah. because of the technique was different. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I want to make a question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, Christina. Um, hi, Kevin. Um, hey. So uh, sorry if this was mentioned. Do you remember if there is a, uh, anything known about the, the situation for uh, that you asked about non-subjective isometries for certain simple Schreier spaces or things like that? Because in that case, you cannot uh, work so easily with extreme. Space. I don't know anything about the non non-subjective. Okay. So yeah, this is. Um... You know that. An interesting thing I, is that for Cyrilson space, I think the proof is easier than for Schreier space, the um, classification of the isometries. Uh, but do you get yeah. something for non subjective yes. in this case? I actually think you yeah. might, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I agree with that. Cyrilson for these things is easier than. Yeah. It's easier, yeah. 
then because then the norm it. tells you what the it tells you how to you know do estimates on blocks right because yeah. you assume essentially that the image of the ei is a block and then you can do estimates on the blocks. And yeah, and, and the other, I think the other reason is that uh, Schreier's are hereditarily C zero. When you take enough, when you take enough blocks, then mm -hmm. well, in Zilsen you can always mm -hmm. know it's never you never get too little one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was actually when preparing the talk, I I was thinking about the because there is this version with Jordan's table, right, which is the version of the zeros on for the non-separable, and also I never looked at it, but it's probably also easier though the the yeah. construction is uh, involving. But mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>